Uh, this evening, um, I thought I would uh, talk uh, for, about epidemics. And the reason I've chosen this as a topic and chosen infectious diseases as my first year uh, of lectures uh, is because they were uh, in this, this year we're coming into, which is the 500th year of the birth of Sir Thomas Gresham, by far the dominant part of medicine. So when this college was founded, medicine was very largely infectious diseases. So these diseases could spread even in periods when uh, transport was much uh, slower. The final concept uh, is the idea of force of transmission. And this is the one bit of maths I'm going to do um, in this uh, talk, but it is a simple one. The key thing to understand with force of transmission, this is the central understanding of epidemics, is if you have uh, a disease which on average passes itself from one person to one person to one person on average, that disease is stable in the population. That has a force of transmission, an R, of one. If one person gives it to two people, give it to four people, give it to eight people, and so on, that has an R of two, and that disease is expanding exponentially. And for those of you who work in the city, this is a compounding problem. Expect exponential increase over time. That is what causes epidemics. And if the R is below one, let's say it's 0 0.5, 10 people give it to five people, give it to 2.5 people, and that disease is on its way out. And if the R is below one, let's say it's 0 0.5, 10 people give it to five people, give it to 2.5 people, and that disease is on its way out. The key with a to control an epidemic is to try and work out what its R is and get it below one. Once it's below one, the epidemic is going to die. Once it's below one, the epidemic is going to die. And so that understanding this number is central to uh, epidemics. And in fact, very large numbers of uh, infectious epidemics have really quite low Rs. They're quite close to one. So the idea of getting them below one is entirely biologically feasible. So if the Ebola epidemic, for example, R was somewhere between 1.2 and 2.5. Flu pandemic, probably between 2 and 3. Uh, polio a bit higher, 4, 4 5 to 7. Uh, HIV, uh, 2 and so on. So it's therefore possible, but wrong, but many newspapers make this point wrongly, uh, so I'm going to make it uh, for them and then say it's wrong, uh, that we are increasingly vulnerable to epidemics uh, because of the massive transport networks we have by land, sea and air. This is just a map uh, of the transport links in the world, uh, how many places you can get to within 24 hours, uh, and as you can see, uh, the United Kingdom is there. Uh, right in the center of this. However, the reason that this is not uh, actually a, as worrying as it looks is that being rich as a society massively hardens society against epidemics of any sort. Being rich as a society massively hardens society against epidemics of any sort. And it does this not primarily for reasons of medicine, which we'll come on to. Medicine does play a role. But in fact, because of all the other things that lead to a successful, rich society. Agriculture, for example, leading to substantially better nutrition. Engineering, leading to better housing. Sanitation, clean and plentiful water, and cleaner heating, as examples. So there are many things we do as societies which are not designed to prevent epidemics, but do so just as a process as countries become wealthier and more developed.
Epidemics cause substantial panic and have uh, substantial social and economic uh, impacts, very often way out of proportion to their actual medical importance. So let's take um, uh, several of the recent epidemics, and you'll recognize uh, many of the, the front pages of the newspapers involved. These tended to dominate the news for very long periods, including in countries which had almost zero chance of significant onward transmission, including the UK. Let's take SARS. Between uh, November 2002 and July 2003, the SARS outbreak, which dominated the news for quite a long period of time, caused just under 10,000 cases and just under 1,000 deaths in 37 countries. Now, that is obviously a substantial tragedy for the individual families, but this is a small outbreak. This outbreak, which we happen to know the data because the World Bank have looked at it, probably wiped around $40 billion off the world economy because it closed down airlines and led to panic in the, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and Canada. A massive influenza pandemic would be a lot bigger than that by many factors and would undoubtedly have a really serious societal impact. So these can have a uh, very big impact on society, even if they are medically relatively less important. 